So let's have a prayer and we'll get started. The Lord be with you. Gracious God, thank you for this gathering of folks who are pondering where you're leading our congregation and how we can help our the children in our hands um, have resiliency in the face of the many challenges in life. And so um, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us in this time. Uh, may it be fruitful for us individually and as a congregation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, we've got two more classes, well, actually three more classes, uh, before I head out on sabbatical and before we kind of get ready to move into our summer schedule. Um, today, I wanted to come back and revisit this concept of adverse childhood experiences. When Cody Russell was here from Kitsap Strong and he presented a lot of their brain research, it was, I think, very interesting. If you haven't listened to those sessions, those are on the website and, and on the YouTube channel. So I encourage you to do that. I find it fascinating and interesting. But what we didn't get to, and Cody kind of admitted he was really going off after people's, they, you, you wanted more brain research, you wanted to hear more about that, so we didn't get to the so what <laughs> of his presentation uh, as much as I had wanted to. So um, he's given me a lot more information, and so I'm going to try and present that to you. And then also I want us to have some time today to ponder, well, what... What am I going to do with this information? What are we as a congregation going to do with this information? And, and who knows what that might be. So this is under the public church kind of realm. We know, that the, we know the gospel, okay? We know the because God has done something for us. Now we're in the therefore. How are we going to respond to this good news? And, and maybe looking at um, adverse childhood experiences and, and the effect of those on individuals Will, will help us with that. Remember what Luther said about the fifth commandment, about the commandment to not kill. He didn't say that just means don't kill somebody or don't murder someone. He said that also means that we're supposed to um, look out for their life. Um, you know, and not endanger our neighbor's life, cause them any harm, but also help and befriend them in every necessity of life. I think taking that seriously, we, that's where I engage with, the, um, with this concept of ACEs, Adult Childhood Experiences. Alright, so, want the bishop... <laughs> what did I say? Adult. Adult Childhood Experiences? Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's been quite a morning already today. So, uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Our former bishop, I've quoted him now a number of times on this, has said that, you know, caring for the poor and our neighbor and those in need is not an option. How we do it is. That's where discernment has to come in. Um, and different philosophical approaches. So let's just remind ourselves of what ACEs are and what they mean. And I'm going to have us listen to the, a little five-minute clip video that I think really sets the stage for what I want to do today. Remember, basically, when you look at ACEs, you're not asking what's wrong with someone, but what happened to someone. And that the more of these ACEs you have, adverse childhood experiences, they've done research that the more likely you're going to be at risk um, for lots of struggles as you move into adulthood. And remember that when we hear about ACEs, we're talking about poverty, we're talking about neglect, we're talking about abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, whatever, you know, that when you experience these, when you experience neglect, when you experience poverty, when you ex experience a, a stress level, um, that's beyond what I suppose one would call typical, 
um, that that has an effect, and not just psychologically, but physiologically, it can have an effect on kids, especially as they're in, um, in the when they're young. So I want us to listen to this um, to this little video, and I think it'll set the stage for what we're doing here today. The social challenges that face modern societies, whether it's the ability to work productively, to be a good citizen, stay healthy, have their roots in early health and development. A strong foundation in early childhood results in much better and more effective development later. A weak foundation really puts us behind. The most important thing children need to thrive is to live in an environment of relationships that begins in their family, but also extends out to the adults who are family members in child care centers and other programs. What children need is that entire environment of relationships to be invested in their healthy development. We've shown from decades of testing interventions that we can improve outcomes. But the magnitude of those impacts is not good enough. Science is now available to help us think about what we might do that would have a bigger impact than the best of what we've done before. So we began to ask, what could we be doing differently? What could we do to be smarter? Children who are at the greatest risk for the poorest outcomes in learning and health and behavior are children who experience a pile the cumulative burden of one after another after another of risk factors. And then the burden is more than any child could be expected to overcome. So we began to focus on the development of the adults. What could we be doing to strengthen the capacity of everyone who interacts with children? This led us to think about the kinds of skills you need to deal with adversity. These skills of focusing attention, planning, monitoring, delaying gratification, being able to solve problems, being able to work in teams, executive function and self-regulation. They're also the kind of skills you need to create a well-regulated home and school environment in which healthy development and learning can take place. And then brain science started to tell us that differences in those skills start to develop in infancy based on the environment kids live in. So, how do those skills get better? Well, if you don't develop them early, how do you develop them later? Actually, you can build them later because the period of flexibility and plasticity for this part of the brain doesn't fully mature until age 25 to 30. So then the light bulb went on. The reason we're not getting a bigger impact is not because we don't know about how to influence development, but because we're giving information and advice to people who we need to do active skill building with. Skill building by coaching, by training, by practice, but we're not doing that. So we now have developed this theory of change that says we need to focus on the development of the adults who are important in kids' lives. So try this. How does that work? We need to focus on their skills, their needs, in order for them to be better, more effective parents, in order for them to be better prepared to be employable, which would enhance the economic stability of the family, which is also good for children. Second of all, we looked at many people in preschool programs and child care centers. And we said, what are we doing to build those skills in the providers? They need skill building as well. <coughs> And also the community can help to build and reinforce the capacities that parents need. And the community also includes programs in which the people who work in the programs have sufficient skills. Third of all, what are the major sources of toxic stress in this community and how can we reduce that? Moving it up to a policy level, how are our policies in strengthening communities' abilities to reduce source of toxic stress and caregivers' abilities to provide what kids need. The development of our human capital is our future. 
the development of a productive workforce is our future, the development of a healthy population is our future. This kind of future orientation is critical for healthy society, it's critical for a thriving business, it's critical for successful environmental relationships to raise children. It's all about being able to plan for the future, to have a future. And that's why this is so important. There's a number of things that are said there that um, I want to highlight. There's, we can come at this with our Christian impulse to try and reduce the toxic stress, the adverse childhood experiences that kids are experiencing. So we can come at it that way, but we can also help to build skills in parents and in volunteers and in uh, mentors in grandparents and aunts and uncles and in congregational members that can help people learn resilience. What I love about this research is it doesn't say, even though it says how powerful these adverse childhood experiences are, it doesn't say there's no hope. In fact, there is hope. There's a lot of hope. So, we can get, what, what he was saying about what they, they're not getting the outcomes they wanted, they realize they can't just give information to people about ACEs, which is certainly helpful, but they also need to help build parents' skills and neighbors' skills and people that interact with children's skills to, um, to help build resiliency in kids. And we're going to look at that today. Um, I'm going to give you some just concrete teaching on some things that help kids with resilience. But then, like I say, I want us to go to brainstorming. What might this mean for us as a congregation? Um, so, okay, let's keep moving. So, features of resiliency. I went looking for definitions. By the way, resiliency is the in-word today <laughs> uh, in education and lots of things. My latest biography, or not biography, but yeah, biography of Luther um, was mostly written by the late Tim Lowell, and he had a student who... After, Tim Wool passed away, wasn't able to complete it, so he's, his student finished it, and um, the title is The Resilient Reformer. <laughs> so, so even in Lutheran circles, we're bringing in resiliency. So there's various ways to look at it, and these are just a number of different um, ways. The capacity to adapt successfully to disturbances that threaten one's viability or development. The ability to avoid deleterious, is that the way you say that word? What does that mean? Like, ne I think negative or destructive behavioral psychological changes in response to chronic stress. So, it's a capacity and an ability, the, a process to harness resources. Uh, again, a capacity to resume positive functioning following adversity. Um, uh, you know, so there's various ways that people come at this, but in other words, it's the ability of one to not be enslaved to these um, experiences that kind of entrap us from making better decisions and good decisions in our lives, that bring wholeness and health to us and our families and our community. Um, so, so that's a way to talk about you know, features of resiliency. So, so here is just some stuff that we can all learn and hear about when it comes to the children in our hands. Many of you are grandparents. Many of you here are parents. Uh, many of you work with other kids. Maybe you're teachers. Maybe you're, and a lot of you, the teachers have heard this and, and do this every day. Um, we have a preschool here. We, we have kids that are in the narthex, running around. And you know what's really cool? Is sometimes I see you know, a teenager talking to a 60-year-old, and that 60-year-old is actually listening to them. We take that for granted, but that makes all the difference. Uh, in, a, in a couple weeks, you're going to have a chance to sit down with some junior high kids who are working on their faith statements for confirmation. You're listening, you're caring, you're supporting them, 
um, can make all the difference in their life. So, so we all have children in our hands in some capacity, some way, some form or another. Um, so here's some, some tips on that. Um, make connections. It's a, it's a relationship of care that is the number one thing that builds resiliency in kids and in future adults. Um, so helping your child to make connections, not just with you, but with other people. Um, helping them to feel somebody else's pain. Um, encouraging them to be a friend in order to get friends. Um, build a strong family network of support for your child because um, the disappointments and hurts are going to come. Um, so, in other words, this is, watch out for isolation. I mean, some of us are introverts, some of us are experts, but still, we need connections, and we need significant um, relationships. And that's a huge way to build resiliency. Um, I'll come back at this in a, in a minute, too. Uh, it's interesting that one of the things that helps kids move through adverse childhood experiences is helping other people. Pastor Bill broke the cardinal rule and didn't turn off his cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so that's, that's a huge thing. We always think about how can I help a kid? Well, you can help, but if you can help them help other people... It's kind of like in the recovery programs where part, at some point in the steps you try and help other people in recovery. And that's a huge part. So, so that's a thing that helps build. Um, believe it or not, having a daily routine. Chaos is tough for kids with going through adversity. And having a routine that they can count on, a time that they can connect with you, parents, whether this used to be the dinner table, right? Not very often anymore. Um, I was talking to one parent just yesterday at the men's retreat, and they just said how awesome it was that he and his daughter actually just went outside, turned off the TV, and ate and had supper together, and they actually talked, and, you know, imagine that, you know. Um, do not, absolutely, whether you're a grandparent or a kid, do not have the TV on while you're having a meal at, on a normal basis. Sometimes, you know, if it's crazy, we sit down, we eat, we're watching this. But do not do that. TV, TV shuts the brain down. When you're watching TV, you have less brain waves than when you're sleeping. And I know sometimes if we're sleeping, we have lots of brain waves with REM and stuff. But, um, and I also, I think, so you have to manage it, each person, but, you know, this cell phone um, should definitely be put away. If you've got teenagers and other kids, just have the rule. Hey, it's dinner time, just power that puppy off and put it away. Um, the, so, um, but having a routine, whether it's breakfast, dinner, things that a kid can count on, um, is really, they're finding very important to building resiliency. Taking a break. Um, routines are good, but endless worrying about achieving is, is, is a, can be a problem. Teach your child how to focus on something besides what's worrying them. So maybe it's a walk. Maybe it is. Maybe they get to play their computer game for a while, or maybe, um, what is it that they love to do? Giving them a break from what's stressing them out, especially with school, is a helpful thing. Um, I think our kids are under the most pressure they've ever been when it comes to school and academics. Because college has gotten so expensive, basically for one kid you have to do a mortgage, basically, today. So, of a house, it's about equal to that, or maybe a little three quarters of what it would be for an entry level house, just for a kid to get a BA. And those kids know that. They know that if their grade point average is in such and such, they're not going to get the scholarship. They're, so, the pressure, the stakes are way higher than they used to be. Give them time to take a break. Um, and right in line with that, self care. What do they need? Are they, um, and this is where I think. It's so helpful with the listening and making connections, going back to the top one. But as you listen, wow, you're really stressed out. Don't, don't go right to fixing things. Uh, problem solving. Make sure you, you say, you're feeling upset. You're feeling sad. You're really confused. You are just beside yourself. 
you're, you know, try and build your feeling vocabulary. I encourage this for everybody in there listening. But, but see what they're going through and then, and, well, what do you need right now? Maybe you need to take a break. And so before you get to problem solving, really be with them and identify what's going on, what the problem is. And then say, well, what do you need to, maybe you need to take a break, or maybe you need to go for a walk, or maybe we need to go down to this store and deal with that, or, you know, whatever it might be, um, encourage your kids to take care of themselves while you encourage them to um, move towards some goals. Kids that have goals, even with the self-care and all of that, um, have resiliency. If they believe they have a future and you set some concrete goals for them, so whether this is a grandkid or a kid, you know, that your, parent, your, your own child or someone you know about, helping them have a goal, concrete goal, like this week I'm going to actually get my homework done in this class, or whatever it might be, it actually tells them they matter. And they're important. Um, you know, th this is kind of, I, I would hope would be basic, but I think there's a way that we can help kids be honest. And, and for us as Christians, we have the promise that we're children of God, that no matter what happens, what other adversity we face, we, here's what God says about you. I, I think that's a, a hugely helpful and important thing. Um, you know, and then finally, um, that there's a sense of hope. Again, a, a kid that has someone that's in a relationship with them, helping them say, you know, there is hope and there is possibility here, um, helps them to believe. And, and them, they're believing they can get through a lot of adversity. These are just some, the, well, we've got a few more. Um, this self-discovery... Um, what is a kid good at? It's part of what they're motivated with, you know? Yes? Yes. So Gary is doing okay? Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Luann. Gary Crawford uh, had a busy spell and we had to get him, get him, get the, the, EMTs, thank you, <laughs> to get the EMTs to come, and, and so he got swooped off to the hospital, and so that's great news that he's doing okay. Uh, you know, when I think about um, it's having something to look forward to, and, and working with kids, what are you good at? What are their gifts? I mean, really think and explore what makes a kid tick, and what are their unique gifts and abilities? Uh, it might be music, it might be running, it might be athletics, it might be, uh, you know, acts of care and compassion. There's all kinds of things, and if you help them discover something about themselves, and the way I've seen this work with mentors is, you know, you're, you're watching, you know, so many times the adults and kids' lives going through adversity are ready to see when they do something wrong. But are you there watching and ready to affirm when they do something not just right, but, but do something that really they enjoy doing that's a healthy and positive thing? Um, helping them figure that out is a really important deal because if you have motivation, you can get through a lot. Um, yeah, the last one, that, that, that don't be freaked out about change. These are all things that... These are good tips to get us thinking about how we build resiliency in kids. Here's what we know from brain science, four keys to countering ACEs. Number one, one stable, caring, and supportive relationship. That just seems so basic, doesn't it? But let's say you've got a kid who's both of their parents are in addiction. And we know, I mean, Frontline just had a thing on the heroin crisis, and they featured Bremerton, of all the United States, Seattle and Bremerton. And there's lots of ways to come at that, but we know there's an absolute crisis when 
it comes to um, heroin, which perhaps comes on the heels of the over-prescribing of, you know, prescription pain medication. Um, that's, who knows why, but nonetheless, I mean, Bob Breen found a needle just in our parking lot just the other day. So, this is an absolute crisis in our community that a lot of people don't even know is going on, but it's huge. So maybe a kid has, um, you know, both parents, they don't have a parent who actually is able to give them care and support. But one person, one person who shows that they really care about that kid, um, can make all the difference in building resiliency. Um, and here's where personal skills, going back to the 10 things that help build resiliency, a sense of mastery over their life circumstances. It, kids who go through a lot of ACEs, if they're given skills and options on how to, to work through, this is their personal choices and their um, get through and have resiliency. This is the second thing. Um, being able to self-regulate. Remember when um, uh, Corey was talking about the brain and, and how it works and that, you know, the frontal part is what regulates us. You know, when we get really angry, what do we do? We flip our lid. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'd go back and want, listen to that. It's a great model of how our brain works. But helping kids have self-regulation skills. I was taught this. Uh, my mom didn't call it this. But she always made me before I got to play, do the chore or the thing that needed done. So we call it today uh, delayed gratification. <laughs> Kids who don't know how to delay their gratification will not do well in life, period. Because we know that's the way it works, right? You know? Um, uh, so self-regulation skills. Wow, I have a temper. So when I get really mad, instead of flipping my lip, I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to, you know, you know so, so teaching kids. So, so it's interesting. Number one is, is having a relationship that, where the kid is cared about. And two, um, their skill levels. And then four, this is what they found. This is so exciting to me. A community of affirming faith or cultural tradition. So, so this research, of course, is not a not religious kind of research, just research. But when a child has a community, it makes all the difference in their lives. I can't tell you. I mean, there's lots of kids here that it probably doesn't happen for. But when I look at our youth program, and I look at how this congregation loves kids and values them um, and is there supporting them, sending them on servant trips, uh, you know, be, you know, listening to them in the narthex. You know what I love? I love when I see an adult doing this on Sunday morning with a kid in the narthex. Because, you know, we're up here and they're down here, some of them at that age. Some of them now are like this, right? <laughs> Thinking of Evan Lund in particular. So, you know, but, you know, getting down their level, um, but a, a community that says you count and you're valuable. Kids can go through all kinds, have a huge ACEs score, and they can still move into life um, and, and have, a, have a good and healthy life. So, interesting, these four are four key counters to ACEs. So, saying all of this, I want to present all of this now to get us talking about what might we do as a community when it comes to dealing with these ACEs, with the adverse childhood experiences, and the toxic stress that a lot of our kids are going through. We can think about that individually, right? You know, I think about my life and my, you know, the children that are now in my hands in addition to my own children. But I want us to spend some time now, what can we do as a congregation? And so this is the way brainstorming works. What if there was an infinite amount of resources and person power, financial, time, there was no limits to time or money, brainstorm, what might this church do to, to help make an impact when it comes to ACEs? 
um, when it comes to the children in our community, when it comes to the toxic stress. And remember that video that you just saw that, well, we've got all these, you know, kinds of stress. Do we try and reduce the amount of stress? Or also, how do we build skills in those who are working with children to help them with adversity? There's both ways you can come at it. What might this congregation do with an infinite amount of resources? That's what brainstorming is. You know, so, and the reason you do this is you don't want to get caught. There's pragmatists sitting at each of your table. <laughs> I know that. And that's fine. That's good. Like, well, but that's not realistic. No, we're, this is not the time to be realistic. That's down the road when you start thinking, well, what actually might we do? But brainstorming is, you know, sky's the limit. What might we do? Lisa, you had a... Oh, I just had an idea. You had an idea. Good. So what we're going to do is on your... Um, I need you to gather up in groups. Um, uh, do you have a piece of paper, Lisa, on your table back there? Okay, we'll get you one. And so I want you... Somebody be a scribe. And I want you to just have a small group discussion about what... What our community or other communities might do um, when it comes to ACEs, okay? Is that clear? Clear? Yep. All right. Gather up. Find a group. Circle, some, circle the wagons back there in the back without a table. Either the scribe or someone else who would like to give a quick rundown. Uh, I'm going to collect these, by the way. And these will be a part of our discussion. So. So before we start sharing some of what we came up with, I want to say that one of the things our consultant who was here a couple weekends ago mentioned um, is that our staff currently does a lot of in-house work, taking care and helping, supporting, equipping, building, um, encouraging the folks who are part of our community, and not as much on the out outside in our community, and we're, we're pondering that. But he also said, you know, another really important thing for SLC is to even get more outward focus than we already are. Because all, I, you know, what most people don't realize is, I mean, I know all of you, or most of you, many of you, and I know what you're doing out in the community. Not just as a member of SLC, but just as a person. So we're very outward focused that way. We have a meal here. We have people who are hungry, who cannot afford, you know, who are here every week getting fed. We do lots of outward things, but he did say one way to get through the ceiling we are is to, it might be a new ministry, a new program that's outward focused. That could be a part of what helps us move to the next level as a congregation. So with that in mind, um, let's hear some brainstorming about what might we do. Let's start in the back with Lisa. And we'll go. We do this on a limited basis right now through the preschool. Yes. But I would like to see them offer free preschool for low-income families. Okay. Um, we do offer some scholarships to students that the family's uh, a, a parent has been laid off or there's right. other issues. But I think on a wider range to offer pre free preschool for low-income families because sometimes the preschool teachers in that environment is the only stable environment that that child has. Right. So. And, and let's celebrate that our preschool is a part of our ministry and is doing that for yeah. the kids that are here. Good, please, good, excellent. Um, the other things that we came up with were um, to adopt a school as far as establishing like a tutoring and homework club. We have a lot of individuals here. Um, highly capable um, scientists, medical people, engineers, um, and providing a um, tutoring or homework club for students in lieu of a parent <coughs> having to pay for something like Sylvan yeah. that they that's yeah. not cheap yeah. that they can't afford. Good. So Good. Um, providing a drop-in center for after school for school aged children and young teens and providing transportation mm. to that center. Okay. So um, and the other things were just um, 
just even just a spare change collection box in the narthex to use for for some of these um, activities and stuff involving kids. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I would I would like to see, and I see this, um, you know, regularly in my practice, is I have a lot of children in foster care, and I know how much those relationships mean to them and how vital it is for them. The goal is always to leave a child in their, with their biologic family, but sometimes that is just not possible. And we need more foster care. So, so maybe our classes or, or just some education about the foster care process. Okay, excellent. Yeah, that was one thing Cody mentioned is that uh, when he was here, how important that is. Thank you. Excellent ideas. Let's keep going, please. So to tap on to that, we yeah. had a lot of what they said, and then we came up with maybe having a program to help the parents help themselves, some education nice. on, even if it's car safety or drugs or whatever it might be, so education for parents, um, and helping parents establish those routines. Well, what are the routines you would like to see in the afternoon? How right. do you do that? Right. Um, which is yeah. something I know I've worked with parents on, so I don't know how to get my kid to do homework. They just want to watch TV. Right. Well, it's the delayed gratification before they watch right. TV. Right. They need to do the homework or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, good. Um, and, you know, we thought maybe a place that families could come, maybe a, you know, an evening meal or movies with the family, you yeah. know, those kind of G-rated movies that right. are... Right, right. Some good family activities to do together. <coughs> yeah, good. Excellent. So you ditto some of what they had in them, but in particular the idea of maybe equipping parents and doing some things, not just for the parents in our church, but, but community-wide on some of this. Excellent. Wonderful. What else? I mean, you can also just say ditto, ditto on a couple of them if they've, they've are, your ideas came up, but let's keep going. Yeah. Just one of the things that came late is a set of seminars teaching teens how to take hold of their financial future. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, remember that graph? I mean, your ability to learn new skills does slow down at the older we get, but still in the teen age and, and young adult, you've still got lots of opportunity to grow. Good. We also had a, a homework club, mentor session, like, like she mentioned. Um, yeah. Doing stuff together in the community, mm. like do a, do a rich top cleanup, just get a bunch of people together and, and do a cleanup. Uh, parties at clothing bank, uh, reading club, <coughs> reading programs, and uh, uh, the CYO model, the Catholic Youth Organization, mm. with um, like a band, kids bands, and things like that. Yep. Love it. Love it. Others? How about over here? Ham? Yep. Uh, Hold on one sec. He's coming. He's coming. There we go. Eliminate the negative when talking to kids. Accentuate the positive. That's you know, yeah. wherever you are. Right, right. Um, the youth group could have activities, special activities, that they're really encouraged to ask friends. Mm hmm Good. And that's really happening now in our middle program in particular. So, good, good. Uh, volunteer opportunities uh, for people to be in positive activities. Yeah. Um, one of the things they were saying was... Uh, and, or you were saying yeah. that they need opportunities to help others. Yes. So providing opportunities where kids or adults right. yeah. can help others. And do it together. Yes. So, um, yeah, good. Also some education on how to recognize kids that are having problems. Mm. And um, one of our Someone was saying that kids that have problems, it often just show they're kind of, it's almost like they're wearing a sign mm. that they have a problem and people avoid them. Right. And so, because it's uncomfortable. It's, it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So, to learn how to recognize that and um, kind of like, yeah. yeah, move forward, go. Yeah, right, and if, involve, if, you, if, you, engage them. if you give people the skills and the preparedness to engage, then they will. Right. Yes, right, right, good, very good. Uh, mm -hmm. see. Oh, opportunities for medical care. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, I'm thinking of the one church, it was, it's not called uh, Christ Memorial anymore, but Gateway? Yeah, and they have a once a year big event where they have doctors and all kinds of stuff for, for dealing with all of those needs. That's a great thing they do. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, yeah. Trying to have situations where we have one-to-one -one kid support. Yes. But also um, support for the parent or the one stable person. Right. Or, yes. Yes. Um, and like a night, one night on a regular basis where some, the parent, the caregiver, what have you, can get out. Yes. Have child care available, but okay. the parent can... Some self-care for the, 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 that significant relationship, so they can... Right, so that yeah. they're... Yep. Um, recharged. Recharged. Yeah. Something, yeah. Sometimes it could be educational, but sometimes just fun. Yeah, right, absolutely. Um, and skills, learning uh, resume writing, uh -huh. along with yeah. other things. Right. Excellent, Ann. Thank you. That great work, group. That group. Um, how others? Things that haven't been mentioned yet, or you can ditto things that I have. Tom? Well, there are four dittos. Yes. <laughs> but anyway. Put it, put it if, right the mic. If, if, you, if you think about uh, giving advice, uh, say something. If, if you see something's wrong, say something. Don't worry about being disliked. If you see a child that uh, needs some work, Say something. Now, that may be to the parent. It may be to who, who is ever with them. Right. But um, be positive in your in, in, in what you're bringing up. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And then uh, foster care, tr uh, troubled uh, child, uh, and after school programs, we talked about that. Offer to listen. That's the big thing. Right. Um, that right now people are not... Uh, doing. They're, yep. not, they're not taking the time to listen to the problems. Yes. You know. <coughs> yeah, that's what we had. Good, good. A lot of dittos. Um, anybody, anything, you want to add anything back here in the groups in the back? Yep. That hasn't already been said? I was going to say, uh, uh, there's a, uh, there's an active Alateen program going on in the county. We could Lend additional support to that. Right. Good. To grow. Good. Uh, maybe expanding hard meals like seven days a week. Mm, cool. Um, this is brainstorming. Then, where does this, you know, and then the, the actual, uh, have an actual youth community, youth center, uh, yep. where there's not just a gymnasium, but, you know, rooms available where kids could meet or right. reading programs right. could go on, art programs, music. Cool. And for uh, kids and cool. I, I want to just, others? Yeah. Well, we'll forget about jamming Facebook. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or shutting down all social media at a certain amount of time. You know. um, so, uh, Ken, I want to just chime in on that one just a little bit in this way. Um, the YMCA here has... I think it's Friday night, they open up their place for kids, and I don't think the kids have to be members or anything, no, they, no. it's just a free, they come, and the YMCA is asking and loves to have adults who just come and hang out, and are there ready to listen. Now, boy, that's, it's already built, Ken, you know, that, that idea, and so maybe what we do is we train up mentors, and, you know, uh, and get and work with the YMCA and you know and we have people down there that are just just there hanging out with the kids love the kids and ready to listen um, like Tom you said uh, that that's who knows maybe that's a part of what, what we could do Barb I see you got the I wanted, yeah. yeah I want to expand on I liked um, Lisa's idea several others mentioned the free preschool along yeah. with that when I had a went to preschool with one of my kids they had um, not just parenting classes exactly, but was teaching you about kids, teaching yeah. you at developmental levels for the age that your child is in preschool at that time. Yep. That was the parents could get together, it was free, it was educational, and it was really helpful. So a lot of times they need free preschool, but the parents need some support too, and 
Um, yeah. They might come up with some mentors right. for those young parents. Um, yeah. Especially yeah. newborns, if you come home with a baby and don't have a support system, yeah. it can be totally overwhelming. So yeah. mentoring, more mentoring for yeah. all ages. Right. Not just, I like the white program, but that's like a Friday night. Yeah. It that's starts at 9 o'clock. Right, right. So some, some kids that's need more. something earlier in the day yes. or other days of the week. That's maybe a smaller setting. Yeah. There are so many people there. Some kids get overwhelmed. Yes. They have no, absolutely. Other, absolutely. That's a very limited yeah. way to do that, in fact. So, yes, absolutely. Good, good. Um, the, the, the ability to help uh, support parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles or foster parents um, and how they um, care for kids and youth is huge. And I, I don't know exactly how to come at that, but I think that's a wonderful brainstorm idea. Um, we, we do that too, don't we? In some ways, we've got the moms group that Pastor Paul leads for preschool moms. Um, we, we, get, we, we get people together on, as a community and, we, and people just talk and we have some small group community groups that provide that sometimes, but, but in particular, how do we do that, you know, moving out is a, is a great thought. These are fabulous ideas. Yes, Ace. Um, as you know, I, I spent four years of my life right. working at the world's largest homeless shelter yeah. in San Diego. Yeah. And everything you said here, we did. Yes. And one of the biggest things that helped, it brought down crime rate. Yeah. Another thing we did that's not as bad up here is we took prostitutes off the street. We're talking about girls 18 and under. Right. Yeah. And we, uh, there was a guy that gave us a uh, warehouse that was four stories high for a dollar yeah. in downtown San Diego. We made it into a, a school for the boys and girls who were prostituting. Yeah. We took a lot of those kids off the street. One of the biggest problems with them was lack of love. Yep. Uh, not having parents, or if they did have parents, narcotics, drug yep. abuse of different types. Yep. And, oh man, did, did yep. it. Did yes. prostitution go down among younger kids? Yep. Because we brought in professionals to run the school. Yep. The doors were locked. Yep. They couldn't go out. Yep. They came into the program. Yep. They were in the program for a length of yep. time. They did their own cooking. Yep. Everything. They had it all set up beautifully and yep. really, really went awesome. down the program. Awesome, awesome ideas, and boy, that's, we see, yeah, yeah that, absolutely. Um, we're almost done with time. You, yeah, please, yeah. Yes, I mean, we have such a beautiful church and a beautiful congregation. I was at the STEM fair this past weekend with my daughters, the science, technology, and engineering math. Yes. It was hosted by the uh, shipyard, and I was thinking that we talked about job fairs and all that. Yeah. And I was thinking one way we could show the community, you know, how beautiful our church is. We have all this open spaces that carry over there. Yeah. Is there why don't we uh, offer it up for like STEM fairs and government job fairs? And that way when the people come in, not only do they see the opportunities available, yes. but they also see the beauty of our church. Beautiful idea. Great idea. Great idea. Um, how a lot of these ideas would would have us partner with other other parts of our community that are working um, to do good things. And uh, no, that's a fabulous <coughs> idea. All right. Um, wh whoever was the scribe, I just want all those papers up here. Um, and let me tell you what we're doing next week, and we're out of here. So next week, which is kind of the last full class I'll teach before the summer, uh, we're going to look at the human condition. How is it that we understand human beings? That has a huge implication on theology, and it's a huge dividing point amongst Christians, and it also has a huge effect on how we try and make the world a better place, too. What really is the human condition? That's our study for next week. Go in peace, serve the Lord. We're grace-filled. Spirit-filled.